In the second section of lecture on flow routing and watershed analysis, we will talk about stream extraction and watershed boundaries. Stream extraction is used for semi-automated stream mapping. It is designed to extract connected stream networks from flow accumulation, which is derived from digital elevation models, using different approaches, for example, a selected threshold of flow accumulation. And we apply this threshold or combination of additional parameters using MAP algebra. And as we have discussed when we talked about display of line features, it is often useful to convert the result, the raster representation of stream network to vector representation and build its topology. There are many challenges when extracting streams from digital elevation models. One of them is that the dynamics of stream origin, which is often driven by additional parameters. So this is an example of stream extraction from flow accumulation. This first, uh, first image shows flow accumulation extracted from 30 meter uh, digital elevation model and using the single flow direction algorithm D8, uh, using D8 directions. And you can see that at this resolution, the stream network looks pretty good and we don't see too many artifacts. We have associated the artifacts with, uh, with, higher, uh, with uh, higher resolutions compared to the complexity of surface. And here the color table is set up in such a way that the flow accumulation starts to show up at a threshold of about 100 cells of flow accumulation. So you already from this raster map see the structure of stream network. And then the stream networks can be extracted using this threshold and converted to vector representation. And here you can see the vector representation of uh, uh, this stream, extracted stream network draped over shaded topography. Here is another example of stream extraction from SRTM data at 90 meter resolution and IFSARE data that come uh, that were originally provided at 10 meter resolution. And this is just an illustration of uh, digital elevation model resolution on the pattern of stream network. And here both of these, uh, these DEMs were resampled to 30 meter resolution to create a seamless digital elevation model and the streams are extracted using single flow uh, direction algorithm D8 directions. And, and so you can see that the um, interferometric, airborne interferometric radar provides much richer structure of the, of the stream network than the 90 meter SRTM data. But we can seamlessly connect them along this edge uh, by resampling uh, or reinterpolating the digital elevation model, in this case, using spline. And the reason why this was done was that the radar mapping was restricted to this area, and for this area, only, uh, only SRTM data, lower resolution data, were available, and we were missing this part of the, uh, of the watershed for this, uh, this river. Now here is another example for, of a large area with extracted streams from uh, SRTM digital elevation model. If we want to create or compute a connected stream network, we often need to route flow through flats and depressions. The flat areas are usually due either to integer digital elevation models, and we already talked about it when we computed slope from uh, integer DEMs. The flat areas can be due 
due to large surface water bodies such as lakes and water reservoirs or they can be due to field depressions. The problem with flat areas that we have already talked about is that they have zero slope. If they have zero slope, the aspect or the direction of flow is undefined. And then we need to essentially create some rule-based uh, approach how to get through these, uh, through these uh, flat areas instead of using gradient direction. So there are a couple of solutions. One of them is iterative assignment of direction from the first draining cell. And then, then another approach is imposed gradient. And this imposed gradient essentially carves in a small stream or is created by small change in elevation. So now, how do we deal with depressions? Depressions essentially trap flow, so they are different from flat areas. Flat areas don't have defined uh, gradient. Depressions have defined gradient except for the pit, for the lowest point. But they have defined gradient, but that gradient points to this lowest point in the depression. So they essentially trap flow. And these depressions in digital elevation models can be real features, and there is plenty of them. Uh, then it can be due to noise or measurement errors, for example, in LiDAR data, or they can be artifacts from processing. And this was mostly the case for the older 30 meter digital elevation models, where these artifacts were due to interpolation. So how do we get through these depressions if we want to, con to create a continuous connected stream network? We need to get through them. So the basic method, the most standard method that is implemented in almost all flow routing uh, softwares is filling. And that means that we fill the depression Essentially, we, so we change the digital elevation model um, by changing the elevation in this area from these values to these values. And we essentially create flats and then we route water through this flat from this point in the direction of this outflow. And this approach is rather simple and works well for small depressions. And we are talking about centimeter, decimeter de uh, depressions. Now, sometimes this, uh, this, uh, this approach creates rather large flats and you will always have an artificial, uh, artificial stream direction in these flat areas. And usually you can recognize them very quickly as straight lines. So sometimes an uh, alternative approach that carves uh, through the increased elevation in this part of, of the depression is preferable. So you would have water flowing all the way down to the depression and then this part of elevation is lowered to this level, to the level of the depression so that the water can flow out. And again, this, uh, this works well for shallow depressions. If the depression is very deep, then this change can be huge and can affect the accuracy of the digital elevation model all the way uh, over quite large distances. So then, uh, then another approach is hybrid. That means that, that the uh, digital elevation model is filled in to certain level. That means the elevation, uh, elevation here in this section is increased to this level. And then it is, this part 
is decreased so that water can flow out and here uh, essentially you are balancing the impacts of these two of these two approaches and you can do this in such a way so that you keep a small gradient here to keep the flow routing more realistic and then the fourth approach uh, is least cost path approach and this doesn't change the digital elevation model but it will flow all the way to the bottom of the depression and then finds a least cost path out of the depression along the lowest gradient. So that way we are essentially using all the gradients that are computed here. We are not changing or throwing away any data. And this is important uh, when these depressions are nested and when they are really, really large. So here is an example of depressions in LiDAR-based DEM. As I said, the, the contour-based digital elevation models from early 90s usually had very small, very shallow depressions, which were usually due to uh, interpolation errors. Here with LiDAR-based DEM, many of these depressions are due to obstructions in the flow, for example, due to the roads or uh, due to noise in the, uh, in the measured data. And you can see here we have lots and lots of depressions. Some of them are lakes like this here, but some of them are due to roads. For example, there is a road here which acts as a dam and essentially creates this huge depression, huge lake here. And we have lots of examples like that and you can see that they are mostly around the roads where these roads create dams, dams for flow. And then flow accumulation, multiple flow direction with depression filling will fill all these depressions and will create rather artificial pattern of flow within these artificial depressions. Here you can see how challenging the stream extraction can be from the, uh, not just from the SRTM DM, but also from the interferometric synthetic aperture radar uh, DEMs. So here is a profile from radar data. Uh, and as we already talked about, the radar data also include vegetation. So the profile is very, very noisy. And you can also see that the depressions are nested. So for example, if I fill the depression here, I'm still not done because then there is another depression that needs to be filled. And then this, then this is a smaller, another different smaller depression. Then we have another smaller depression. And as you go down, there is actually, this is the entire nested depression. So you have entire hierarchy of depressions here. And this is actually many kilometers long depression. And you can see that if you fill this, you will influence the digital elevation model over a large area. And it indeed leads to artifacts in the stream extraction. And here you can see it is in this area. And the white line is the stream extracted using the filling algorithm and the blue line is uh, the stream extracted using the least cost path algorithm that uses all the elevation data doesn't fill the, this huge depression and the red points are the points uh, that were measured directly on the river on the ground so you can see that in this case the least cost approach is much more accurate because it doesn't fill this huge nested depression. And here is another example that shows what is going on. So here we have the digital elevation model. You can see that it's rather noisy. 
and because of an obstacle somewhere here, this entire area, almost entire uh, main stem of this river uh, is filled. So here is the filled depression. So the depression is huge, several kilometers long. And through this depression, because it is flat, the flow routing is then straight, really straight lines. Here you can see the same. And not only, uh, not only we have a lot of artificial pattern in the stream network, but we also miss here river confluence. And here you can see the result from the least cost path routing. So you can see that it routes it nicely through this uh, through this area and also the confluence is captured correctly. Here is the, the result of carving. I said that another option is to carve, uh, uh, carve the streams into the DEM. If you have known streams with known elevation, that's the best approach. But usually we just have two dimensional stream and then the carving can be pretty deep and, and uh, create some artifacts. And uh, it is important to note that these, uh, uh, these digital elevation models that have removed depressions but also removed flats, that means that gradient is defined uh, for each, po each grid cell in this digital elevation model. The, that type of DEM is called hydrologically conditioned DEMs. Sometimes in literature they are referred to as hydrologically correct, but uh, such term needs to be avoided because uh, these type of digital elevation models have all potential wetlands removed. So for example, when you are looking for wetlands, when you are looking for areas where water stands, you won't get it because all of the depressions and flat areas were removed. So we, and this procedure is essentially done to run uh, hydrologic models that require de uh, depressionless digital elevation models. And that's why we call them hydrologically conditioned. And then I will conclude the, the flow line topic with the with one uh, interesting application of upslope flow lines. Uh, so it needs to be mentioned that the flow lines that are rooted downslope create these flow accumulation maps that can, uh, and those can be, we have shown that those can be used for stream network extraction. If you create upslope flow line accumulation, they con these upslope flow lines converge on ridges so you can use them to extract rich uh, structure of ridges. And we have, this is useful in those areas where you can't use uh, tangential curvature to extract the ridges because the, the topographic feature is so smooth. So that's the case, for example, with dunes. And this is Jockey's Ridge and the upslope flow lines accumulated on the ridge of this dune and allowed us to extract this dune, this, this ridge and compute, for example, change in mean slope on this ridge, which was an indicator then uh, whether the dune is stabilizing or not. So this is really just, a, uh, just another way how to extract ridges using the using flow accumulation when generating flow lines upslope. We will finish this section with brief description of watersheds. Watersheds are important land management units because water and mass from a watershed drains to a single point and this point is usually called outlet. There are many other terms that are used for watershed, for example, drainage basin, catchment, or in very general terms, when it is associated at any po with any point in landscape, we can call it contributing area. And in a similar way, like stream networks, watersheds can be organized into hierarchies based on the size of contributing area. And a good example of such hierarchy of watersheds 
are USGS hydrologic units, which define drainage areas of major rivers all the way down to smaller uh, stream networks. And you can learn more about the hydrologic units on this website. Or what kind of tasks uh, are performed as part of GIS watershed analysis? Essentially, it's two major tasks. One is to find watershed boundaries for a given outlet. So we have a point in landscape, usually on a stream, and we want to know what is the contributing area from which water flows into this given grid cell or into a stream segment. Then another task is uh, to partition area into watersheds. Let's say we have a region and we want to partition it to smaller uh, units that drain into a single point or into a stream segment. So we will be then defining uh, entire set of watersheds for a given study area. So what are the methods used to find watershed boundaries? They are essentially same uh, as for flow accumulation. So the basis for finding watershed boundaries is uh, flow routing. But here we are essentially doing a reverse process. When starting from outlet, we trace all cells going upslope using reverse flow direction and until we can't go upslope anymore. And we classify all these cells with single ID and they define the watershed that drains into this outlet. Now, when uh, computing contributing area or watershed boundaries for a given point which is supposed to be on a stream and for which we have coordinates, for example, because there is a gauge uh, located, then we need to make sure that this uh, outlet that we are using to extract the watershed is within a grid cell that has the ma local maximum of flow accumulation because that will ensure that we capture the entire contributing area. Then another concept that's, uh, that's very important when doing uh, a GIS analysis of watersheds is incomplete contributing area. That means that when you are dividing your study area into watersheds, there may be, you may have a large river coming through your study area and that large river drains area that is outside your study area and then we have incomplete contributing area and the flow accumulation for that large river will be incorrect so these uh, these rivers or the streams where the flow accumulation starts outside the study area or outside the given computational region they are usually coded in some way for example uh, by negative numbers to indicate that this number is incomplete and can't be used, for example, to measure actual uh, flow through this, uh, uh, through this river. So here is an example of area that is divided into watersheds and it's our study area. Uh, so you can see that there are certain watersheds that are not complete, like here on this side, in white color here, in black color here, on the shaded topography. Here is another example of a large watershed that is divided into a smaller set of exterior watersheds. And again, we have one interior sub-watershed. And this is, uh, this is uh, watershed of Rio Chagres in Panama and the streams and the watershed boundaries were extracted from the SRTM digital elevation model. And this is the extraction of watershed 
for a given outlet. So here we have an outlet where we have, for example, a monitoring station and we want to outline contributing area for this watershed. So again, we run flow accumulation. We find where is the maximum of flow accumulation closest to this point that defines the location of monitoring station. And from there, we can delineate the uh, the watershed boundaries using the flow directions that were used uh, to extract the streams and flow uh, to compute the flow accumulation from this DEM. There is a lot of information about watersheds and about stream data uh, on the web provided by USGS. For example, Edna project provides hydrologically relevant parameters from digital elevation models, and it is provided by USGS. I already talked about the USGS hydrologic units, which are also available in digital form. And they are, uh, there are also uh, worldwide watersheds available that were developed based on 15 second digital elevation model derived from 90 meter SRTM. And what was interesting, this project was actually funded by World Wildlife Federation. So this is all about flow tracing and uh, uh, watershed analysis. And in the next lecture, we will look at some basics in hydrologic modeling and erosion modeling.